Weather weapons. Weather will affect the performance of military equipment to a certain extent, for example, in thunderstorms, the radar wave of the radar will be interfered with, and if there is rain, it can make infrared detection equipment to detect the object lose accurate positioning, so it can be seen that the weather is an extremely important factor for war. Timing is a famous saying that has been passed down from ancient times to the present day in China. Timing refers to the influence of weather, and apart from Zhejiang in ancient times, there are also examples of weather factors affecting the war situation in modern times. For example, in the Ardennes counterattack in 1944, Germany was victorious because of the bad weather, which made it impossible for the Allied forces to utilize their air superiority. At the time of the Normandy landings in 1944, the weather conditions were even more important to the Allies, and the timing of the attack was decided according to the weather conditions. The influence of weather on the battlefield is already so obvious, then if it is a tsunami, earthquake, typhoon, tornado, and other large-scale disasters, for the battlefield is a decisive factor, in the face of such a large-scale natural disaster, all the warships, airplanes, tanks will be destroyed by the devastating destruction, if the disaster is serious enough, and even able to wipe out a country in the world directly. According to meteorologists, the energy of a strong thunderstorm system is equivalent to the explosion of a 2.5 million ton nuclear bomb, even if it is partially used, it will also generate enormous combat energy. So in the 21st century, with such advanced technology, can mankind control the weather? The answer is yes, now the speed of human development, such as in agriculture, artificial rainfall, to increase crop survival rate, but also be able to directly blow away cumulonimbus clouds, at certain times to reduce the amount of rainfall, all of these are mankind's interference in the weather. There are several ways to control the weather. One is to change the weather conditions. Since World War II, the United States has been conducting research on artificial influence on the weather. During Eisenhower's presidency, the U.S. military made it clear in a research report that weather control is more important than the atomic bomb. Since then, the U.S. has conducted dozens of secret meteorological research projects, including the Argus project to create earthquakes, the Skyfire project to create lightning, and the Gale project to create hurricanes. The Gale project for hurricanes the Spanish newspaper El Insurgent has revealed that the United States is conducting a high-frequency active auroral research project on the Alaskan Peninsula. Bernard Eastland, the person in charge of the project, hypothesized that by affecting the ionosphere of the Earth, not only could it provide submarines with advanced and convenient communication systems, but it could also lead to anomalies in the Earth's climate environment. With the development of atmospheric science, Mankind has mastered more than 20 kinds of artificial influence on the weather technology, which can play a role in the role of tactical weapons are man-made floods and storms, man-made drought, artificial fog and fog, man-made cold, cold and heat, artificial control of thunder and lightning and man-made guide typhoon, etc. In 1968, the U.S. Air Force Base in Alaska was covered by a dense fog, loaded with several hundred tons of military supplies of the transport aircraft is difficult to take off. The U.S. Department of Defense used artificial fog elimination techniques to spread anti-fogging agents in the air, so that a large number of small fog spots quickly condensed and turned into raindrops on the ground. The fog soon receded, and 185 aircraft were able to take off and land safely. The second is to change the movement of the Earth's crust. The Earth itself is a huge energy-gathering body, in the underground boiling lava stored in a huge energy. If this energy breaks through the limitations of the Earth's crust, it will trigger earthquakes, landslides, and other destructive disasters. Seismic weapons are special weapons that use underground nuclear explosions and non-nuclear explosions in specific environments to artificially induce or create earthquakes, thereby achieving certain military objectives. The United States and the former Soviet Union from the mid-20th century began to try to study earthquake weapons, made some progress, not only carried out underground nuclear explosions triggered seismic tests, but also carried out non-nuclear explosions induced seismic research. 
Third, changing ocean conditions. At present, the military potential of ocean weapons has already amazed the militarists of a few ocean powers. Among them, the more typical ones are tsunami weapons, sea curtain weapons and giant wave weapons. In nature, the more harmful tsunamis are usually triggered by earthquakes, when an earthquake occurs, the two plates of the Earth's crust in the seabed movement and friction with each other, the upward movement of the plate above the sea water will suddenly rise, the downward movement of the plate on the sea water will suddenly sink in a short period of time there will be a huge difference between the water level, and thus triggered a tsunami. According to the relevant data show that the magnitude 6.75 or more of the earthquake is very easy to cause tsunamis. With the maturity of seismic weapons technology and computer simulation technology development, tsunami weapons will certainly be a new face on the battlefield. For warships and marine facilities as well as land-based warfare, wind and waves are an important factor that should not be underestimated. Huge winds and waves often lead to shipwrecks and the destruction of military facilities. Therefore, the use of wind and waves and the ocean's internal polymerization energy can make the ocean surface and deep ocean submarine tides, thus causing the enemy naval vessels, submarines and other military facilities to capsize and personnel deaths. Wave weapons can also be used to seal off coasts and stifle enemy warships from attacking. However, so far, the real method of causing giant waves has not yet been introduced, but has only triggered some small waves, which can be regarded as a precursor to the use of giant wave weapons. Fourthly, it will change the ecological environment. Biochemical meteorological weapons are relatively easy to develop, but they are also the most potentially harmful weapons. It is a weapon system that utilizes biological or chemical drugs to cause ecological damage to the enemy's land, crops, and environment, thus indirectly achieving the purpose of war. For example, chemical rain weapons evolved from earlier meteorological weapons, which mainly spread chemical substances that could prevent the Earth's surface from radiating heat to the enemy area, turning the enemy's land into a dry desert and causing changes in the ecological environment, and through artificial rain and snow, the rain and snow carry chemical agents to corrode the opponent's weaponry and even kill the enemy's personnel, destroying the ecological environment, etc. After the 1970s, chemical weapons were used to destroy the enemy's land, crops and environment. After the 1970s, an electromagnetic radio frequency, EMRF, weapon that can have a significant impact on the climate quietly surfaced. The principle of this weapon is to send powerful very low frequency electromagnetic waves to the sky, forming a huge blocking layer in the air, so that the airflow in the high altitude to change the path, and will affect the climate change of the airflow front blocking, thus causing climate anomalies, droughts and floods for years to come. In the 1950s, US President Eisenhower already made it clear that mastering meteorology is more important than mastering the atomic bomb. In order to seek absolute superiority in the field of meteorological weapons, the US military has implemented the Skyfire program to create lightning and the Storm Rain program to change the direction of storms by implementing artificial rainfall around hurricanes. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program (HARP) is still in progress. The project focuses on the use of high-frequency electromagnetic beams to control the upper atmosphere. Some American physicists consider HARP to be the world's greatest weapon in the war on weather. Powerful radio radiation of up to 1.7 billion watts can heat the ionosphere, creating an overtemperature radiation environment that can cause droughts or hurricanes on the Earth's surface, as well as creating artificial electromagnetic storms that can disrupt navigation systems and affect weather and people's psychological state. Studies have shown that the Earth's magnetic field is rapidly weakening. In the last 160 years, the strength of the magnetic field has dropped by a staggering 10%. Jeremy Bloxham, a geophysicist at Harvard University, says it's clear that certain processes within the Earth's core are actively destroying parts of the dipole magnetic field. Most of the disruptions are occurring in the same location, the South Atlantic Magnetic Anomaly a region near southern Africa and South America where the direction of the magnetic lines of force in space is reversed. At the same time, 
there are frequent outbreaks of disasters around the world. In the 1820s, 1830s, early 1900s, and 1840s, Africa experienced widespread droughts, but these droughts ended in less than 10 years. For example, the droughts of the 1940s occurred between 1939 and 1943 and lasted about four years. But more recent droughts, such as the recent West African drought of the 1960s, lasted for nearly 20 years until the mid-1980s. It is widely recognized in the scientific community that microwaves and other types of radio frequency pulses can be transmitted with virtually no energy loss if they are operated at a specific frequency or in a frequency limiter. Using a machine such as a microwave cyclotron, a powerful pulse can be generated to drive a beam of energy. This theory, if used for military purposes, could lead to the creation of powerful electromagnetic radio frequency weapons. During the Cold War, the former Soviet Union remained about three to five years ahead of the United States in this area of research, thanks in large part to TELSA's work. On July 4, 1976, the former Soviet Union began to send out powerful electromagnetic waves, which were then called the Russian Woodpecker by Western wireless telegraph operators. The main frequency range of the Russian electromagnetic signals was concentrated in the very dangerous 10 Hz band, which is usually referred to as very low frequency. Since that time, the electromagnetic wave has been continuously occurring, with a frequency that varies between 3.26 Hz and 17.54 MHz, and it is pulsed several times per second, making it sound like a humming or woodpecker sound. After tracking, it was discovered that the waves, which originate from Kiev in the Soviet Union's Ukrainian territory, constantly form a huge blocking layer in the air, causing air currents at high altitudes to change their paths and blocking the front of the air currents from normal weather changes. It is said that Russia's very low frequency transmitters are capable of creating months or even years of drought, as well as devastating floods. In fact, Russian and US scientists have been conducting research and development on vectorless electromagnetic energy technology for decades. After the end of the Cold War, this is no longer a secret. It was this technology, used to alter weather patterns, that caused the massive flooding in the Midwest in the summer of 1993. On July 4, 1977, exactly one year after the Russian woodpecker began transmitting, the US began its own experiments with UHF weather, which resulted in a torrential downpour over six counties in northern Wisconsin. This UHF-induced rainstorm brought strong winds of up to 157 miles per hour, causing $50 million in damages and destroying 350,000 acres of forest. Geomagnetic anomalies and geoelectric anomalies go hand in hand. Abnormal changes in the geomagnetic field so that the surface geoelectric field changes, the formation of geoelectric positive anomalies and negative anomalies. Surface water evaporates from the geoelectric positive anomaly area to the high altitude, carrying positive electricity, from the geoelectric negative anomaly area evaporates to the high altitude, carrying negative electricity. Since the same kind of charge attracts and different kinds of charge repel, clouds with different kinds of charge are most likely to attract each other and form thunderstorms. On the contrary, clouds with the same type of charge repel each other resulting in drought in the region. Iceland, West Central Africa and the South Atlantic Ocean are three negative anomalies, the area between them is obviously arid, including the driest Sahara Desert, on both sides of North America and Asia are positive anomalies, in the positive and negative anomalies at the junction of the high precipitation area. When the magnetic anomaly area changes, the strength and polarity of the electric field also change accordingly and the resulting changes in precipitation lead to global droughts and floods in different regions. Artificial electromagnetic radio frequency EMRF, can alter the electromagnetic properties of clouds, thereby creating floods and droughts. Floods and droughts can also be prevented if the opposite is true. Increasing the homogeneous charge causes the water molecules in the charged cloud to repel each other and expand, reducing the chance of rainfall while increasing the heterogeneous charge causes the water molecules in the charged cloud to attract each other and contract, increasing the chance of rainfall. 
the use of modern technology to interfere with the climate, man-made tsunamis can wash away the villages in the basin, man-made earthquakes can directly destroy the city, torrential rains, flash floods, tornadoes, etc. can create a wide range of destruction, not only change the environment of the battlefield, but also can directly cause harm, which is the role of meteorological weapons. This is the role of meteorological weapons. In the 21st century, the rapid development of science and meteorological science has shown that the use of man-made natural disasters, geophysical environment weapons technology has been basically shaped, meteorological weapons is a weapon not less than the harm of nuclear bombs. The principle of formation of meteorological weapons, is through the creation of explosions to change the movement of the Earth's crust, triggering earthquakes and tsunamis, or through the creation and control of stratospheric air currents and air pressure, the formation of man-made rainstorms or man-made typhoons. This kind of man-made disasters on the Earth's impact is very huge, directly damage the Earth's natural ecological environment, if the long-term use of meteorological weapons or the use of large-scale meteorological weapons, it is very likely to cause excessive damage to the Earth. For example, if the continued use of explosions to change the Earth's crustal movements, the Earth's crustal movements will become very frequent, a few days there will be an earthquake, such an environment will make human habitation impossible. The impact on the Earth's atmosphere and stratosphere will lead to the Earth's ozone layer to create a hole, the Earth's air becomes thin as possible. The rapid industrial development of the 21st century and the emission of automobile exhaust are affecting the Earth's environment to a certain extent, and there is even a hole in the ozone layer in the North Pole. The global warming of the temperature is gradually making the Earth an uninhabitable environment for human beings, and these are the effects of human daily life on the Earth. Because of the close relationship between climate and war, all countries have actively promoted military meteorological research and most of the relevant meteorological references have been incorporated into the relevant operational programs of their militaries, and meteorological technology has also continued to develop and advance because of the needs of war. In 1946, the US successfully completed a test of artificial rainfall, which opened a new page of human influence on meteorology, and in the 1960s, the US military and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration NOAA, conducted a study on meteorology. In the 1960s, the U.S. military and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration NOAA, collaborated on a climate modification program called Project Storm Fury. Scientists used AC-130 transport aircraft to fly into the hurricane storm cell and put silver iodide, an effective artificial ice nucleus, into the cloud wall near the center of the hurricane, called cloud seeding cloud seeding, through the process of seeding clouds to make the cloud wall near the center of the hurricane disintegrate, and then create a second cloud wall in the periphery, and by expanding the center of the hurricane, it was possible to create a second cloud wall, and then create a second cloud wall. The process of cloud seeding allows the cloud wall near the center of the hurricane to disintegrate, creating a second cloud wall in the periphery. After intensive field experiments, Scientists found that man-made methods could not alter the natural process of hurricane internal dynamics, and therefore discontinued Project Window Breaker experiments on U.S. soil in 1983. In addition to meteorological research, countries have also attempted to create favorable battlefield environments by manually influencing meteorological conditions, and have further developed meteorological weapons by taking advantage of the characteristics of meteorological conditions. In 1943, the U.S. Army used airplanes to create a fog layer 5 km long and 1.6 km wide in order to protect the Allied troops from crossing the Volturno River in Italy. In addition, in order to protect important industrial bases and military installations during World War II, Germany dispersed large quantities of aerosols along the banks of the Volturno River in Italy to create a dense fog that prevented Allied warplanes from approaching and bombing. During the Vietnam War, 1955-1975, the U.S. Army used the Southwest Monsoon to conduct meteorological warfare against North Vietnam in order to combat the transportation of North Vietnamese troops. In 1971, 
the U.S. Army used the southwest monsoon to carry out a weather warfare operation called Sudden Eye, in which more than 26,000 flights dropped more than 4.7 million rainfall catalytic bombs, whose main ingredient was silver iodide, on the clouds over the battle area, thus creating heavy rainfall and localized flooding. Damage to bridges, dams, roads, and villages caused North Vietnamese supplies using the Ho Chi Minh Trail to drop from an average of 35,000 tons per week to about 2,000 tons per week, effectively blocking the North Vietnamese invasion to the south. The destruction of the Ho Chi Minh Trail effectively prevented the North Vietnamese from invading the south. In addition, scientists have found that artificial rainfall in a certain area can lead to a drastic decrease in rainfall and even drought in the surrounding areas. 1970, the U.S. military used meteorological weapons to conduct a war on drought against Cuba, which resulted in the failure of major economic crops and affected the stability of the society. During the U.S. military's war in Afghanistan, 2001-2014, the U.S. military used thermobaric bombs, which produce high pressure, high temperature, and consume large amounts of oxygen in the target area, to attack terrorists hiding in bunkers such as caves and tunnels, with significant results. Such results made the U.S. demand for meteorological weapons even stronger. In 1994, U.S. physicist Easterland conducted more in-depth research on meteorological weapons and launched a weaponized experiment based on the results of previous U.S. meteorological research. In 2005, at the Pentagon, Easterland led all the scientists working on meteorological weapons to conduct a simulation exercise for the U.S. generals and senior leaders. The content of the exercise is not known, but at the end of the exercise, in Easterland's report to the U.S. Pentagon, it was written, Weather warfare technology will mature over the next 30 years. It will give the U.S. military the ability to change the climate by creating artificial rainfall that floods enemy positions droughts that deprive the enemy of fresh water, hurricanes that lay waste to enemy cities, laser lightning that shoots down enemy planes in the air or renders them incapable of taking off, and microwaves that send heat into the atmosphere to disrupt enemy communication and radar systems. The US has very ambitious plans for airborne weapons. Not only does it want to develop airborne weapons research on a large scale, but it also wants to put them into use directly in future wars. In the research of the relevant personnel, there is even a very extreme means of attack, that is, directly to the electric cloud layer to launch energy, the electric energy in the cloud layer to increase, then in the release of lightning, the power can be increased by tens of times to hundreds of times. Moreover, the United States has such a means, and they have the world's most advanced reconnaissance aircraft, the Blackbird reconnaissance aircraft which is capable of directly energizing the clouds at high altitude. In 2015, a technical report published by the National Academy of Sciences NAS, suggested that solutions to climate change could include removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or altering clouds or the Earth's surface to reflect more sunlight back into space. Point 19. But Alan Robach, a scientist, has told us that the US has the means to do just that and they have one of the world's top scouts, the Blackbird Scout, which can energize clouds directly from above. However, scientist Alan Robach told the media that the CIA was one of the funders of the report, and that the CIA has funded other climate modification programs with the real goal of artificially controlling the climate of other countries. Point 20. Rosalie Bertel, a longtime pioneer in environmental warfare research, has pointed out that the United States has been secretly working on climate change. Rosalie Bertel, a longtime pioneer in environmental warfare research, points out that the United States has been secretly engaging in research on weather weapons, and the U.S. military released a report in 2005 called Weather, a Force Multiplier, Weather Weapons for 2025, which explicitly lists weather analysis and application as a key weapons technology for development. The U.S. military published a report in 2005 called Weather, a Force Multiplier, possessing a weather weapon by 2025, which clearly identified weather analysis and application as one of the key weapons technologies to be developed, 
with the goal of controlling the weather on the battlefield within 200 square kilometers by 2025. Although the Convention on Environmental Change restricts countries from applying climate science to war fighting activities, some countries are still very enthusiastic about the development of weather weapons, with the US being the most proactive, and the technology and achievements it has mastered are ahead of those of other countries, so the development of weather weapons in the US is worth paying attention to, with the McKinley Climate Laboratory MCL, being the most active. Among them, the McKinley Climatic Laboratory and the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program HARP, have attracted the most attention. Since climate is closely related to military operations, the US began conducting research after World War II on the effects of meteorological conditions on weaponry and troop operations, as well as on the ability of personnel to adapt to the environment. In 1949, the U.S. military established the McKinley Climate Laboratory MCL, in Tampa Bay, Florida, to conduct research and simulations of more than 30 climatic environments around the world. The McKinley Climate Laboratory includes the Wind Laboratory, Rain Laboratory, Lightning Laboratory, Temperature Laboratory, Desert Laboratory, and Marine Laboratory, which are capable of producing hurricane force winds of up to 30 meters per second torrential rainstorms of up to 380 meters per hour, and thunderstorms. Rainstorms, severe weather with thunderstorms, rapid drop of indoor temperature from 80 degrees Celsius to minus 40 degrees Celsius, and simulation of deserts similar to those in Africa. Degree Celsius, simulate a climate similar to that of an African desert, create waves similar to those of the sea, and regulate and control water temperature. The laboratory has been in the conditions of minus 10 degrees Celsius to minus 25 degrees Celsius, by sowing chemical powder to the cloud layer, the cloud water droplets into ice-like material into the ocean, so that two kilometers long dark cloud disappears. The two mile long cloud disappeared. The lab can also easily produce medium sized snow and ice falls. Because the McKinley Climate Laboratory is equipped with weather modification capabilities, U.S. Army Special Forces are trained in Rhine forests, deserts, polar regions, plateaus, and maritime environments designed by the Climate Laboratory to develop their operational capabilities in complex weather conditions. The U.S. military is also a leader in the field of combat operations. In addition, more than half of the U.S. military's weapons and equipment are tested at McKinley Climate Laboratory before they enter service where they are subjected to a variety of weather simulations to verify their performance. However, the ultimate goal of the McKinley Climate Laboratory is to develop weather weapons. More than 70% of the weather weapons used by the U.S. military were developed by this laboratory, and the weather warfare conducted by the U.S. military against the North Vietnamese Army on the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War was precisely a research project of the McKinley Climate Laboratory. The weather battle that the U.S. Army waged against the North Vietnamese Army on the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War was the result of the research of the McKinley Climate Laboratory. In addition, the British monthly magazine Focus reported that the U.S. military had secretly conducted dozens of meteorological research projects through the McKinley Climate Laboratory, including the Algos Project to create earthquakes and the Gale Project to create hurricanes, Project Skyfire which uses lasers to create lightning, and Project Storm, which uses artificial rainfall around hurricanes to change the direction of the storm. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program HFARP, is a cooperative ionospheric research program between the U.S. Air Force, Navy, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency DARPA, and the University of Alaska, and was conceived and prepared as early as the 1990s. However, the basic engineering was not completed until 2003, and the program was officially launched in 2005. The program was conceived and prepared as early as the 1990s, but the basic engineering was not completed until 2003, and experiments were formally launched in 2005. The site is located on over 30 acres of land on the military base Indiana Gacona, Alaska. The core of the HFAP consists of a metal array of 360 generators and 180 antennas more than 10 meters high, capable of transmitting 3.6 million watts of radio waves, 
72,000 times the power of the world's largest commercial radio station, to a depth of 100 to 100 meters above the Earth's surface. It can transmit 3.6 million watts of radio waves, 72,000 times the power of the world's largest commercial radio station today, to a specified location in the ionosphere, 100 to 350 kilometers above the Earth's surface, to increase the speed of electronic activity through heating and to alter the structure of the ionosphere to manipulate meteorological conditions. Other important equipment includes ionospheric research instruments, ultra-high frequency radar, flux gate magnetometers, ionospheric detectors, electromagnetic induction instruments, etc. Some scientists have pointed out that high-frequency active radar can be used to detect the ionosphere, but it can also be used to detect the ionosphere. Some scientists have pointed out that the high-frequency active auroral research program can focus powerful radio waves into a powerful wave with more energy than a nuclear explosion, and accurately shoot it towards the ionosphere, tearing the ionosphere apart with enormous heat and creating a large hole, thereby affecting clouds, clouds, and other weather conditions. Hole, thereby affecting clouds, wind direction, and rainfall, so that unpredictable changes in the weather, or because of the stimulation of changes in the ionosphere to trigger earthquakes and tsunamis, and even change the Earth's magnetic field, using these ways to change the weather in a particular region these methods can be used to change the weather in a specific area, create favorable battlefield conditions, and deliver an absolute blow to the enemy. In addition, high-frequency active auroral research programs can send high-energy ion streams along the local geomagnetic lines to ionize gases by cyclonic oscillation heating, and when the density of charged ions reaches a certain level, they will be transformed into ions. When the density of the charged ions reaches a certain level, they will be transformed into plasma, which can form a natural barrier in space and interfere with and destroy enemy communications, or be used to detect the location of military bases and facilities of other countries, and can also be used as an it can also be used as an electromagnetic weapon to attack enemy missiles, satellites, airplanes, and other targets, which will be destroyed within 0.1 seconds under the influence of the huge super heavy pressure difference and inertia point 26 secondly the carrier wave emitted by the high frequency active auroral research program is in the frequency range of 2.8 to 10 megahertz which can affect the ionosphere in the electrodes after being emitted into the ionosphere the frequency range of the carrier wave emitted by the high frequency active auroral research program is 2.8 to 10 megahertz and after it is emitted into the ionosphere it can affect the electric current flowing in the ionosphere, called the electrojet, and the electrojet in the polar region is called the auroral electrojet. Through the control of the auroral electrojet, extremely powerful electromagnetic waves can be generated, with high frequencies up to several million hertz and low frequencies between 0 and 1000 hertz. When the frequency of the electromagnetic wave matches the frequency of the human brain, 0.540 hertz, it can have the effect of controlling consciousness and influencing emotions. If the frequency of low frequency electromagnetic waves is controlled at 60 Hz, it may even damage deoxyribonucleic acid DNA, which is responsible for guiding the development of organisms and the operation of life functions in the human body, resulting in serious bodily harm. In 1994, Bernard Eastland the host of the U.S. High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program HFARP, reported to the Department of Defense that, in addition to providing advanced and convenient communications systems for U.S. Navy submarines, HFARP could detect enemy underground nuclear testing, track cruise missiles and enemy warplanes flying at ultra-low altitudes, destroy enemy power and communications using high-frequency waves, and possibly even change the climate in a given area. In addition to providing advanced and convenient communications systems for U.S. Navy submarines, the program could detect enemy underground nuclear testing, track cruise missiles and enemy fighters flying at ultra-low altitudes, use high-frequency waveforms to destroy enemy power and communications, and even change the climate of a specific area to disrupt the enemy's ability to conduct warfare. In addition, the report mentions that weather weapons will mature within 30 years, 
by which time the US military will be able to create artificial rainfall to flood enemy positions, create droughts to shorten enemy water and food production, create hurricanes to destroy enemy economies and infrastructure, and cause loss of life and property. Facilities, causing loss of life and property, and even spreading diseases and climate refugees, using lasers to create lightning to shoot down or disable enemy planes in the air. They use lasers to create lightning to shoot down enemy planes in the air or prevent them from taking off, and they shoot microwaves into the atmosphere to interfere with enemy radar systems and communications. However, the development of ionospheric research, whether for ozone layer remediation and climate improvement research, or for meteorological weapons testing, is a very dangerous endeavor because such programs this is because such programs could seriously affect the balance of the Earth's ecosystem and cause irreparable damage to the Earth's physical state, geology, and species, ultimately leading to the destruction of the planet. For this reason, high-frequency active auroral research programs are of great concern to the scientific community, and have attracted the opposition of many specific individuals, organizations, and other governments. In fact, the ionospheric research program originated during the Cold War, when the United States, in an effort to detect the location of Soviet nuclear submarines in the deep ocean and to improve the quality of their communications, initiated a high-frequency active auroral research program in an attempt to one of the principles was to utilize ultra-low frequency ULF, radio waves as communication signals for deep-sea submarines. One of the principles was to use the electrojet, a beam of electrically charged particles in the ionosphere, as an antenna-like transmission tool to send messages to submarine submarines. With the dissolution of the former Soviet Union and rapid technological advances, the original motivation for this research no longer exists, and proponents continue to come up with new ideas to keep this type of program alive, including the use of ultra-low frequency radio waves. These include the use of ultra-low frequency radio waves to detect enemy mobile missile bases and underground bunkers, solving the damage caused by solar storms to satellites, communications, and power equipment, reducing the radiation released by high-altitude nuclear explosions, and altering the electron density of the ionosphere to influence radio waves. The researchers have also studied various physical aspects of the auroral formation process, such as changing the electron density in the ionosphere in order to influence the propagation of radio waves. Although the high-frequency active auroral research program is led by the US military, it is open to the academic community, which facilitates the development of the research programs and makes them more efficient through collaboration with the academic community. The program's research process has produced green auroras manually in the ionosphere at altitudes of 100 to 150 km above the Earth, although this is more efficient than the Norwegian European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association ESCSA, which is the only research organization that has produced green auroras in the ionosphere. Scatter Scientific Association ESCAT, in Norway created the world's first artificial aurora through ionospheric heating. In other words, the high-frequency active auroral research program is not what it seems, and it has not only brought new perspectives to atmospheric physics research, but has also furthered mankind's understanding of nature. However, the program was suspended by the US government in 2013 because it was met with so much skepticism and was so costly. Whether it will be resumed in the future, or actually applied to warfighting activities, remains to be seen. But what is certain is that, at least for the time being, mankind does not yet have the ability to artificially modify meteorological conditions on a large scale. But it is certain that, at least for the time being, mankind does not have the ability to modify weather conditions on a large scale by human means. In addition to the United States, some countries are also conducting research on weather weapons. For example, Russia and Norway have long been researching physical changes in the ionosphere, and Norway was even the first country in the world to create artificial auroras by heating the ionosphere. Norway was even the first country in the world to create an artificial aurora through ionospheric heating, but the scale and results of Russia's and Norway's ionospheric research programs lag far behind those of the United States. In addition, Russia has long been secretly engaged in solar weapons research, 
and continues to conduct experiments on triggering large-scale earthquakes and tsunamis with nuclear bombs. The United Kingdom is another important country in the development of meteorological weapons. In 1998, the British military deployed a series of electrodes along the west coast to inject electricity into the atmosphere, causing the ionization of magnesium atoms in the convective layer to create an electrostatic shield of variable density, which was then connected to the sun. The electrostatic mask is then adjusted to determine the generation and disappearance of high pressure and low pressure weather, thus achieving the purpose of weather control. The British military claims that they have the ability to control rain and shine within a radius of 5,000 km with a success rate of over 93%. In 2009, the British military further announced that they had successfully developed the Thermal Pressurized Aerosol Weapon TPAW, which is a weapon that utilizes heat waves, pressure, and aerosol to strike a target. This weapon applies the principle of advanced oil and gas explosives, so that after hitting the target, the projectile produces a large number of dense fog explosion cloud, through the heat fog and pressure to cause casualties to the enemy inside the building. Britain's heat pressurized aerosol weapons have been used in the Afghan war and have been effective against Taliban forces. Although China has not yet achieved any significant results in the development of meteorological weapons, during the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008 and the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China CPC, in 2009, the meteorological forces fired rain-eliminating rockets to carry out artificial rain-eliminating operations to ensure the smooth conduct of the events on that day. The operation was not only smooth, but also technically sound. The operation was not only smooth, but also technologically advanced which makes outsiders believe that the CCP is capable of engaging in research on meteorological weapons and will produce destructive meteorological weapons within 20 years. It is foreseeable that more countries will invest in the development of technology to affect the weather in battlefield by human means, as well as in the research of meteorological weapons. Despite the terrible experience of two wars and the invention of the nuclear bomb, the possibility of a destructive war is not high but countries are still researching for a more destructive and deadly weapon. After all, once any country possesses a certain absolute weapon, it will gain bargaining chips on the military battlefield or at the political negotiation table. Because weather weapons can disguise themselves as natural phenomena and deal unexpected blows to the enemy, they have become a tool of war that some countries are actively developing. The current status of the development of meteorological weapons is not known to the outside world because the development of weapons in various countries is carried out under extremely confidential circumstances, and will be kept as secret as possible before being used on the battlefield. However, the gossip-filled media often exaggerates this with science fiction-like narratives and reports, and military and intelligence units are always skeptical and curious about the development of weapons in rival countries, which leads to a lot of suspicion and speculation about weather weapons.